Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about hemodialysis. But before we get into it, make sure you go over and check out ninjanerd.org. That's where all our notes and illustrations for all the lectures that we put up here on YouTube are available for you guys to utilize. And then, comment, subscribe, and hit that like if you can for this video. Let's get started now with hemodialysis. So when we talk about hemodialysis, as we finish through our renal series here, we're focusing on why the patient needs hemodialysis, what is hemodialysis, and then how do we care for the patient through hemodialysis as the nurse, how are we caring for them, what are we doing for them. So the first question we wanna answer is what is hemodialysis? We have a patient who has lost function or is losing function within their kidneys. They're having a really big decrease in the function and the ability for their kidneys to clean the blood, right? Because what does the kidney do? It removes the waste, it helps homeostasis and balance everything in our body, our electrolytes, our hormones, our fluids. And because of that, if there's a dysfunction, that disruption within all those balances and those fluids and those wastes, we start to get buildup of waste, we start to get imbalances with all those things. And because of that, then we can't function properly. So if our kidneys are not now working properly, we start to have an issue with all of those functions. So we can do something called hemodialysis, which we take blood, right, and we dialysize it. What does that mean? So we can hook this patient up to a dialyzer, and what we can do is we can take blood from the patient, clean it, remove all those wastes, kind of make the balances back to where we want, and then pump that blood back into the patient, right? So we do this in order to get this patient's numbers and levels and everything back to where we want them to be, or at least to make this patient be able to be functioning. This takes a long time, right? We have a, our heart and our cardiovascular system works so hard to clean our blood, to get through the kidneys, right? Pump it all through there. Our kidneys are working 24 seven. These patients have to go to at least three sessions per week, roughly around three to five hours per session. And that's a long time. If you think about it, think about how our body is constantly cleaning the blood. This patient's only going three times per week for three to five hours. All that time they're not there, that waste product is building up. Those imbalances are occurring. And because of that, these patients need to be on schedule and frequently go to these sessions. So it's really important for hemodialysis for these patients because they're not having that 24 hour, 24 hour, seven days a week function. So what is hemodialysis? It's taking blood from the patient, putting it in the dialyzer, and then putting it back into the body. So if we look at it in this way, we have that dirty waste blood, everything that is building up in there, goes to the dialyzer, it gets cleaned and balanced, and then the blood gets put back into the patient. And there's a lot more that goes on within these sessions, but this is just the overview of what we're looking at here. So now let's talk about how this occurs within our patient because we have a patient that is having dwindling kidney function. So at what point do they need hemodialysis? So with these patients, typically we see that kidney function decrease over time. They have chronic kidney disease. Maybe they're at stage two, but we know the way they're looking in a couple more years, maybe a couple more months, they may need to start getting dialysis. When this happens, this patient needs vascular access. What is vascular access? Vascular access is either a fistula, a graft, sometimes for temporary central venous catheter, where this patient can be accessed for a dialysis. So when we talk about a fistula, what is a fistula? A fistula is when we can surgically adhere a vein and an artery together. So as you see here, we have the radiocephalic, right? We take an artery and a vein, we surgically put them together. So now, where we have this blood flow, there's a lot more turmoil within here. I like to picture what's happening in a fistula as an ocean meeting a river, right? We have an ocean that's crashing in onto the beach. We have a river that's trying to flow down into the ocean. So you're getting this like turmoil, this churning of all this water. It's, like, it's just a lot of movement, a lot of turbulence in there. And that's essentially what is happening within a fistula. In the loop graph, what we do is we can take a graft and then we can graft together an artery and a vein, but we add in this own little synthetic vein, artery, whatever version, vessel if you wanna call it, so that we can also have an access point here for hemodialysis. Why is this important or why, why do we need to talk about what a graft is or what a fistula is? They're typically in the lower forearm and they're used for dialysis because if we were to put just two IVs in a patient, that dot, 
diameter of the IV is very small, right? So it's going to have less flow rate or a slower flow rate. That slower flow rate means in that three to four hours, we are not cleaning or changing and altering and balancing blood as fast as we would as if we had a fistula or a graft. These fistula and grafts are able to hone in on bigger vessels or bigger opening diameter of the needles. So those two needles that go in are able to pull blood through really quickly and clean a lot more. So it's very important for us to be able to assess these for a couple reasons. The first thing is when this patient has to go, it's come to that point in their journey where they're saying your kidney function's not that great, you might be a candidate for hemodialysis. This patient's gonna have to get surgery. This is not I can get surgery and then tomorrow I can get dialysis. It takes six months for this to heal. And I don't mean to heal enough for the patient can just live their full life. I mean heal for them to or use it for dialysis. So after those six months, this patient is now able to use this fistula or this graft for dialysis. In that time, kidney function might be depleting. The blood is accumulating, right, with all these different types of waste products and hormones and electrolytes. We may, in turn, be able to use a central venous catheter to at least clean, it, clean the blood, give them some dialysis. But at some point after that six months, we have this healed and we can use it. That's a lot, right? Think about it, a patient's got kidney function that's a problem, they had surgery, it took them six months, now we can finally use this. That means we don't want this to be compromised in any way. We want to keep this as good and as new and as useful as possible. So us as nurses, they always ask on the NCLEX or on the nursing exams, the way to remember it is you can feel the thrill or hear the brewing. Feel the thrill meanings when you have a patient that comes in with their fistula, you can put your hand on it, right? You put your hand on it, you can feel that, that vibration of all the blood going through, that turmoil. Remember, I'm talking about that ocean and the ocean crashing and the river running in. It's just a lot, lots going on in there, a lot of churning and burning. So you can feel that, you can feel that vibration. And then you can hear the brewery. You take your stethoscope, you put it on here, you hear the swooshing, you just all of this blood moving around in there. We always want to assess the fistula or graft because if there is a problem, we want to get it done sooner rather than later and check in on it because again, six months to heal. So for patient education, when we're assessing and learning to how to assess fistulas and loop grafts, but we're also teaching our patient, we just adhered an artery to a vein, right? Arteries are usually carrying our blood. Let's get a different color here so we can see. They're carrying this blood down, you know, all the way into the furthest points of this hand, right? Right, all these into these fingertips. But now we just made a hole that shunts blood into a different vessel. So we have compromised blood flow to the hand. And that's normal with a fistula, but it shouldn't be so compromised that we have issues with ischemia. So when we're teaching our patients to assess their own fistula, and warning signs to look out for, we're also thinking about perfusions, the biggest thing. So with patients, we wanna to talk to them about, is your hand looking pale? What's that word that we talk about in nursing? Pallor, are we noticing pallor within the patient? It's hand, right? Anything distal from that graft or from that fistula is going to show us if there's pallor, maybe there's compromised um, perfusion to that hand. What about tingling? Tingling is also known as paresthesia. Are they having issues with blood flow to that fingertip and they're having sensations of tingling? Are they having issues with that fine motor skill? Is there a change in the pulse? Now you're gonna think, what the heck, what do you mean? When you get a fistula done, right, we have our radio, so we have our radial artery and our ulnar artery. They're both going through our hand into our wrist, into our fingertips. The pulse on the artery that has gotten a fistula is probably gonna be very faint or a lot harder to feel check the other side. If there's still a pulse in the other artery, at least we're still getting some perfusion to that hand, right? We also have the cap refill times, might be slightly different from one hand with the fistula versus the other, but they should be at least something that is not alarming. It's not taking 10 seconds for that finger to turn back to its right color, right? And then are they having any pain? That pain is causing ischemia, right? They're not getting oxygen to those blood vessels, they're not getting oxygen to those muscles, so they're starting to feel crampy, starting to feel pain, distal from that site. So we wanna make sure that we're telling them, if you're having any of these things, please call your provider, 
call um, the doc so we can know. Note that we can come in and assess you too. And these are things that we're also looking for with this patient. And there is one thing that can occur within these patients. It's called AV fistula steel syndrome, where it takes away perfusion completely from that hand. When that does occur, this is a big issue that we have to go into further with these patients and see is there another spot? Are they another candidate for a different area for a fistula? Because we can basically put an artery in a vein anywhere on the arm because we want it to be close to the uh, vascular axis, close to the surface. So we want to make sure that this is a good area, but if it's not, then we have to go further and further up the arm. Further and further up the arm means more areas of the arm that aren't going to get blood flow or compromise blood flow. So I hope this makes sense. Now we have a patient that has gotten a fistula and a graft. It's been six months, and now it's time to set them up for their first dialysis procedure. So let's talk about that now. Now we have a patient who has gotten their fistula, right, or their graft. They have waited those six months. It's healed. They haven't been lifting anything heavy. They haven't been wearing anything constricting. Everything within that fistula and that graft is working great. So this patient comes in for their first dialysis treatment, and the biggest thing that the NCLEX always likes to ask is, was there consent? So the first thing you're gonna do is make sure there's consent. Once we have consent for this patient, we can then go in to start with our pre-prep, with our assessing this patient, seeing what's going on with the fistula of the graft, making sure that it looks good. We can put on a limb alert bracelet for that side that has the graft. We can assess their vital signs, and we're making sure that we feel the thrill, feel the thrill and hear the brewy on that fistula as well. And then we're gonna check our pulses, our pain, are we having any tingling, is the cap refill good, are we having any other issues with this patient in order to make sure that that fistula is working properly and that we are ready to have dialysis today. When we assess this patient's vital signs, we're particularly taking everything into account with the blood pressure and the temperature as well because they're really important. So we want to make sure with the vital signs we are in normal ranges for this patient. And we also are going to then take some labs from this patient to check where we were when we are starting our hemodialysis. What's our BUN and creatinine at? What are our electrolyte levels at? What are our anticoagulant levels at? With our vital signs and our labs, one of the most important things to do for a patient before hemodialysis is also taking a weight. Remember, we're getting a patient here who is going to have fluid changes within the body, right? We're gonna have fluid and electrolyte shifting. We're taking stuff out, we're adding things in. So we wanna make sure that the weight they come in at is very similar to the weight that they're leaving at, that we didn't leave them too dry or we didn't leave them too wet when they do leave dialysis. So real quick, we have consent. We have checked their access point, that all looks great. Their vital signs are looking normal. Their labs are looking as we expect somebody to come in and get dialysis. They're probably a little, wacky all over the place, but we're hoping to get those better and corrected by the end and not worse. And then also checking their weight. With these patients, there's many medications that they should not take prior unless instructed by their doctor. When we look at the medications that should be held, if you have a patient that's inpatient, meaning they're in the hospital on your med surge floor, but they will be going to dialysis today, these are the meds that you want to think about holding. If it's a patient coming from home, these are the medications that you want to say, hey, you shouldn't be taking that before you come in. What are some of those medications? We want to start thinking about all those medications that could be affecting blood pressure because one of the problems with dialysis is going hypotensive. We want to think about diuretics, right, that are taking fluid off. We want to start thinking about medications that are vasodilators, opening up those blood vessels that are causing a patient to potentially go hypotensive. We also want to think about digoxin and nitroglycerin. Uh, nitroglycerin is dilator, but uh, digoxin as well. Think about antibiotics, vitamins, B and C, and folic acid as well. With the antibiotics and the vitamins, you want to focus on those because those are quickly, uh, they can quickly be dialysized out of the patient. Meaning through this procedure, if they took that medication and they sit there for four to five hours, we're just taking that medication right out of them and it's not even doing anything for them. So what we want to do is hold anything that is going to affect blood pressure, and then we also want to hold things that are going to metabolize really uh, slowly within the body that are re-erased basically by dialysis. And then we can go into our intra-procedure. Everything's looking good for this patient. Our patient is now ready to go in and get dialysis. <clears throat> so 
First thing we do is get the vac vascular access points ready. So they get their two needles inserted and now we're ready to roll with dialysis. So intra procedure is mostly about monitoring the patient. We wanna make sure that those vital signs are looking within normal ranges. We wanna monitor their lab work as we're looking at them. And then we're also monitoring the machine, the, the kidney of the patient. The dialyzer helps us control the fluids that are going in at the rate that they're going in, what's going in with it. So we can add in anticoagulants like heparin in order for the patient's uh, blood not to clot right at the tips of either of the needle. We can also change the dialysate that's going in so the patient could be getting different levels of certain things for individuals. We can change out what they are. So overall, the intra procedure is keeping an eye on the patient and keeping an eye on what's going on with our machine. We also want to think about when we're constantly assessing this patient, we want to tell them or teach them things that they're looking for, particularly if this is their first dialysis treatment. We want to say, you know, let me know if you're having a headache. Let me know if you start feeling like you're nauseous, you're feeling dizzy, you're feeling faint, you're having any is other issues that I should know about, muscle cramping. Because we want to be on top of those because we're going to talk about those complications in a minute. And what's really important is that we want to catch things in the beginning and be able to continue to monitor them so they're not getting worse, give medications if we need to to those patients as well. So one of the biggest things is just teaching them about what are those warning signs. Then with these patients, because we are giving them heparin typically throughout this procedure, we also wanna have our protamine sulfate at bedside just in case something were to occur where the patient starts bleeding, right? All of a sudden their blood pressure starts dropping. We see a little bit of bleeding at the the IV sites, and then we are also thinking, is there something else going on? We're giving this patient an anticoagulant. Is there a hemorrhage going on somewhere else? Is there a bleed that's occurring that we can't see just yet, but the vital signs and the neurostatus change are indicating something else is going on? And then it's all about just having that patient sit and occupy themselves. Maybe they'll sleep, maybe they'll read a book, watch TV, whatever, but it's all about that emotional support and then having them be occupied with something for that period of time that they're in the, in the chair. And then we can go into our post-procedure. We can take the needles out, right? We can wrap it, apply a light pressure. We don't want to press too hard, but just light enough pressure to hopefully stop that bleeding. If the site does not stop bleeding for around 30 minutes, you can notify the healthcare provider, see if we can do anything else for this patient, wrap it, give them something else to stop whatever it would be necessary. So the first thing is removing those needles, right? And we're checking to seeing if the bleeding has stopped. If not, provide the, talk to the provider. We're also gonna look at post-procedure versus pre-procedure. What do those vital signs look like? What do those labs look like? And what is the wait now after? And as we compare them, we're looking to see if there's anything that the patient maybe has to take while they're at home. Maybe we over dialysized on something and now this patient needs to take a little more vitamins at home. And then we also want to make sure that they are still keeping an eye on those changes or those things that we want them to know about. Are you feeling nauseous? Are you starting with a headache? Is there something else going on? Do you feel dizzy? Do you feel faint? All of those things are going to point in our indication that maybe there's an issue that again we aren't seeing but could further complicate their issue. And then we want to make sure that this patient knows when they're going to be coming back and what other procedures are, are gonna be down the line for them. So let's quickly touch on the complications that can happen during or after hemodialysis. Let's quickly touch on here some complications now with hemodialysis. The biggest thing right here is our vascular access or loss of our vascular access. Once the patient has that surgery, from that day forward, we want to make sure that we are keeping that access point as long as possible, as healthy as possible. So loss of access. What does that mean? We could have clots that form, that's why these patients go on anticoagulants. Could be stenosis occurring within that. There could be other issues where right when the patient gets surgery, they're wearing too constrictive of clothing or jewelry, or they get a blood pressure done on that side, and that constant compression, they sleep on that side, causes a, an issue with the fistula, right, with the access point. So we wanna make sure that they are not doing those things. They're also not carrying anything heavy. So Depends on what the provider says, somewhere between five to 15 pounds, we don't want them carrying anything heavy. So I just say, if you can carry it in your other arm, then just do that because 
keeping that fistula for as long as possible and as healthy as possible is the biggest concern because once we have a complication with our access point, remember it takes six months for it to heal. So all of a sudden we have a complication with this access point, now we have to go down the road of what surgery can we get, when can that get done, and anything further down the line, do we need to put a central venous catheter in the meantime for this patient. So biggest complication or one of the main concerns is the loss of that access point. We could get infection of the vascular access, which is not great either. There wasn't great sterile technique. Patient wasn't taking care of it at home. They, they picked at something, whatever. And now we have an infection in that area. Not great. Because is, if there is an infection in that vascular access point, we're not gonna be able to use that for dialysis, right? If this patient has an ongoing infection, it's looking a little puffy, it's looking a little red, it's looking a little uh, uh, slimy, right? There's maybe some pus underneath there. We're not gonna be using that. We're not sticking two needles in there just to give them dialysis just because there's still an infection in that area. So big problem here could also go in with our loss of access, right? Get an infection in the area, we really can't use it, therefore we have now lost our access. But the other point of infection we can touch on is an underlying infection. Maybe the patient's older, right? They aren't really aware of what's going on with their body and they didn't notice that they've had a decrease in urine output or that they're starting to breathe a little heavier. And then we start to dialysize them and they start to crump really quickly, right? They start to decline. They're not doing so great. Could be that there was an underlying infection. We see a spike in the temperature. We see an issue with them as we're dialysizing them. And maybe there was a UTI. Maybe there's a respiratory infection going on. So an underlying infection could also cause an issue with dialysis. It's gonna put a lot of stress on the body. And then once the patient goes into dialysis, that could be a lot of potential stress as well. And then we don't have a great outcome during that dialysis session. Moving on to bleeding, hemorrhage, and hypotension. I've kind of put them all together. Bleeding and hemorrhage, we are giving these patients throughout dialysis anticoagulants, right? So they have potential to bleed. Access point bleeding could be one. Could also be that there is an underlying bleeding issue. Maybe they have ulcers now that are forming a GI bleed, and now potentially they are hemorrhaging, so they are showing low blood pressure. And then also hemorrhaging could also call the, cause the low blood pressure issue. We have a patient that we're dialysizing too quickly, right? Maybe they're not bleeding altogether, but there is dialysis, their dialysis treatment here. This rate today is just too fast. We're trying to clean as much blood as possible, so maybe we tried to up the rate a little bit. This patient can't handle it. Their blood pressure starts depleting. So this patient, we need to slow that rate or change that rate as well. We could also have them having an issue with um, the hypotension. Could be that we change the rate and they're still not responding. We give them some fluid and then they're still not responding. That's when we need to slow the rate even more, stop it or call the provider because we are having an issue now that maybe it's out of our hands and it's in this area. So we have bleeding from the access point, maybe an underlying bleeding. There could be, like we said, an ulcer, a hemorrhage somewhere, and then also hypotension. Is it hypotension just related to the rate? So if we change it, they look great. But if we give them fluids and they don't respond, then maybe we're having something else going on with this patient. So if they don't respond, contact the provider. Moving on to muscle cramps. This again has to go on with, we're changing the fluids really frequently, we're changing the electrolytes really frequently. So patients could eventually develop muscle cramps, especially if certain electrolytes are out of balance more than others. If these are having muscle cramps, it's good for them to tell us, right? We can do a couple things for them. One, we could just note it and we could change the rate. We can also at this point check their labs. If their labs are showing that there is a change, we can address that medically, right? So if they have some type of um, electrolyte that's way too high, we can give them something else to bring it down or bring something else just as high so they stop having cramps. We could also just give them medications to help with that. So if they're having a cramp, we can give them some medications depending on their care plan. And then the last thing we do is also provide a gentle stretch for them as well. And then what goes into this patient is we can talk about nausea and vomiting. And as we get down to the bottom here, it's gonna be even more important that we talk about nausea and vomiting. But when we are touching on this, when we're looking at this patient, Again, those rates are changing really quickly. Their fluids are changing really quickly. So this patient might start exhibiting some nausea, maybe some vomiting. So we can give them some antiemetics, but we also wanna note what's going on with this patient, right? We give them antiemetics, they're not working. It could just be that it's nausea, vomiting, or 
there could be an underlying issue like disequilibrium syndrome, which we'll talk about in a second, that is altering them as well. So we can give the patient their antiemetics, but with this nausea and vomiting, this is where we also want to think, is there something else going on? Is there an issue neuro? Is something else going on? So we want to note that they're getting nauseous, but we also want to start talking about disequilibrium syndrome. So disequilibrium syndrome is an issue where the patient's fluids have changed so quickly. So what am I talking about? We are dialysizing a patient and their body maybe has never done this before and this is their first session. So it's really rare for someone to have this, but it is something that the NCLEX likes to talk about and it is something you always want to be aware of, particularly if this is their patient's first session. So they're coming in for dialysis, they're getting their first treatment today, and what is happening? We are taking levels that are high, right, and we're adjusting electrolytes and we're adjusting fluids, and one of those is their BUN, right? Their BUN, we're trying to bring that thing down. It's so high, it's jacked up, and we bring it down maybe a little too fast. When we bring it down, we cause all these issues, we can give them cerebral edema or intracranial pressure increase. With those two things, come those two things, either one, they start to have a lot of symptoms. A lot of symptoms that look like all these other complications, right? They might start having nausea, vomiting, or they might be saying, I don't know, I feel like a little faint, a little dizzy, maybe their blood pressure starts dropping. And we start to investigate further and further and further, and we start to think, I think this patient is having disequilibrium syndrome. Because of this, this is something that is an emergency. This is something that we want to make sure we address because we are in the realm of neurology here, right? The neuro. So if this patient has increased cerebral edema, if they're having increased intracranial pressure, we're going to start to see other things like altered mental status, confusion, and then hopefully it does not go into loss of consciousness, seizures, things like that. So we want to make sure that we address this really quickly ways that we can do that. Maybe we just gotta change the rate. Is there something we gotta give back to them a little bit in order to balance them back out? And then note this and also tell the provider, right? This is an emergency that we don't want to get worse, we want it to get better quickly. So that is it, Ninja Nerds. That is our lecture here on hemodialysis. I hope it made sense. I hope you learned fr something from this lecture. If you did, make sure you hit a thumbs up, comment down below, and as always, until next time.